After three years of stringent COVID-19 measures, the economy of mainland China has lost its vitality. Private businesses are struggling to survive, with many going bankrupt, leading to a surge in unemployment. 90% of small processing factories in Jiangsu and Zhejiang have closed down. There's a wave of factory and brick-and-mortar store closures, with properties everywhere being closed, transferred, or rented out. You have no idea how difficult it is to run a factory these days. Without orders, we still need to support a large number of people, and our warehouse space is vast and largely empty. On one hand, we have high labor costs, and on the other, we have rising commodity prices and material costs. All of these factors can cause a factory or business to collapse in an instant. After three years of pandemic, export processing factories are closing down. In 2016, I was an entrepreneur with a net worth of over 100 million RMB and the chairman of a top-level dye factory in Zhejiang. Regrettably, I stand before you today as a failure, still bearing a debt of 11 million RMB. I guess many business owners of physical companies feel the same way as I do, unable to eat or sleep. As a once prominent entrepreneur, I used to own the largest number of weaving and dyeing processing factories and several foreign trade clothing companies in Zhejiang. They were all companies with an annual production value of over 100 million RMB before 2016. Now I am a debtor, a defaulter, and what they call a deadbeat. Every day feels like a living hell. Recently, the Chinese Communist Party's top echelons held a series of economic meetings publicly acknowledging new difficulties and challenges facing China's economy. This represents a shift in their usual stance of suppressing private enterprises. The government is now introducing measures to address the needs of these enterprises. On August 1st, the National Development and Reform Commission of the Chinese Communist Party once again released so-called measures to promote the development of the private sector, a total of 28 provisions. This follows another set of 31-point guidelines announced by the State Council of the CCP on July 19th to encourage the growth and development of the private economy. Public opinion generally believes that the latest measures by the Chinese authorities are related to the increasingly severe economic situation in mainland China. The recession of China's economy and massive unemployment have become ongoing indicators to watch. On July 17, China's Bureau of Statistics announced that the unemployment rate among Chinese youth in June was 21.3%. However, Zhang Dandan, Associate Professor of Economics at Peking University, stated in her recent article that for March, if the estimated 16 million individuals refusing to work and living off their parents are considered unemployed, the actual youth unemployment rate could be as high as 46.5%, far exceeding the official rate of 19.7% announced that month. Another young economist from Zhejiang who wished to remain anonymous for safety reasons commented that the data released by the Chinese government, a regime known for its lack of transparency, cannot be trusted. He said, these statistics are a tool for the government to control society and essentially no different from actual propaganda. If the Chinese government told the truth and conveyed real signals, it would undoubtedly cause panic in the investment market, leading to further collapse and even political instability. In fact, numerous measures, including the 31-point guidelines, have been frequently introduced, but they have been given the cold shoulder in the securities market, with investors not buying into them. On July 20th, the day after the 31-point guidelines were announced, the Shanghai and Shenzhen composite indices fell by 0.92% and 1.06% respectively. Due to three years of pandemic control measures, market demand in China has weakened, dealing a heavy blow to businesses. Data released by the Bureau of Statistics on July 27 show that in the first half of the year, the profits of major industrial companies across the country fell by 16.8% year-on-year. Private enterprises recorded a total profit decrease of 13.5%. The mainland media outlet Securities Times recently released a survey report that asked 60 economists from government departments, research institutions and renowned universities about the evaluation of China's economic performance in the first half of 2023 and predictions for the second half. 76% of the respondents believe the economic development in the first half was rather cold. And 86% believe that the major risk of China's economy in the second half of the year is a lack of confidence and willingness to invest among entrepreneurs. 
Recent statistics revealed by the National Development and Reform Commission show that private investment in China is continually shrinking. In fact, before the recent release of these so-called measures to promote the private economy, as early as 2005, the Communist Party's State Council had introduced the several opinions on encouraging, supporting, and guiding the development of non-public economies such as individual and private economies, also known as the 36 non-public economy measures. In 2010, they introduced the 36 private investment measures, and 2019, the 28 private enterprise measures. Coupled with the recently released 31 point guidelines in 2012, 2015, and 2023, the total is 173. Compared with the past, the content of these recent announcements remain unoriginal. In response to this. Hu Li Ren, a Chinese private entrepreneur based in the U.S., stated that historical experiences from the public-private partnerships of the 1950s have shown that under the Chinese communist regime, the private economy can achieve genuine development and prosperity. He has no confidence in the introduction and implementation of these 31-point guidelines. He said there is only one path for all so-called private economies, which is to move towards public ownership. This is the essence of the Communist Party. If you have studied Marxist-Leninist theory, you would understand that the public-owned economy dominates everything and it aims to completely eliminate privatization. In 2019, mainland Chinese economist Xiang Shongzhuo openly stated when discussing the private economy, "There is a classic saying that encapsulates the general mentality of private entrepreneurs: needing us is a choice of desperation." Eliminating us is a lofty ideal. Today, if you look at China's economy, you only need to look at the private economy and whether private entrepreneurs have confidence. I think the biggest issue facing China's economy today is that history has repeatedly proven that state-owned enterprises can't perform well. If state-owned enterprises could do well, would we still need reforms? Can businesses prosper under the centralized leadership of the Communist Party? In fact, at the initial stage of the CCP establishment, all forces for economic construction and development came from private enterprises. Where were the so-called state-owned enterprises then? In order to consolidate its nascent regime and to follow Marx's theory of the proletarian revolution stages, the CCP decided that China must first undergo a 15 to 20 year capitalist transition period before fully establishing the socialist public ownership and entering socialism. The transition period was termed by them as a new democracy period. In March 1949, Mao Zedong pointed out in his report at the second plenary session of the Seventh CCP Central Committee that private capitalism would be allowed to exist and develop for a considerable period. As for the method of nationalizing private property, the common program passed by the CCP's political consultative conference in 1949 stipulated. The economy of state capital operating with private capital is an economy of state capitalist nature. Under necessary and possible conditions, private capital should be encouraged to develop towards state capitalism. Note that it says encourage without any element of compulsion. However, the actual pace of public-private partnerships was astonishingly rapid. Large-scale public-private partnerships began as early as the beginning of 1956, and it was not until February 24, 1956, that the CCP Central Committee passed a resolution to reform the capitalist industry and commerce. But by the end of the first quarter of that year, 99% of private industry had already entered into public-private partnerships, with 85% of private commerce doing the same. By 1956, the CCP's socialist public ownership economy had accounted for 93% of the national income, with private industrial enterprises almost extinct. Many private entrepreneurs ended up in dire straits during this process. For instance, during the period when Cheng Yi was mayor of Shanghai, in just two short months from January 25 to April 1, 1952, the number of private capitalists who committed suicide reached 876, averaging over. Over ten suicides per day. Many chose to commit suicide with their spouses, and some even wiped out their entire family. Mao Zedong once made an assessment of 
the assets of Chinese private enterprises, saying there are 2.5 billion yuan in the industry and 800 million yuan in commerce, totaling 3.3 billion yuan. Mao later described the socialist transformation of industry and commerce as purchasing a class. He said, "With such a small amount of money, we bought out an entire social class, including its intellectuals, democratic parties, totaling about eight million people." Due to the societal shocks caused by the CCP's political campaigns after taking control in China, especially the ten-year Cultural Revolution. China's economy was on the brink of total collapse. At this time, the CCP urgently needed a transfusion to keep it alive. Alongside the implementation of the reform and opening up policy, private enterprises gradually revived. Together with the division and reorganization of the transnational manufacturing industry chain that began in the 1990s. And the release of the mainland population dividend. Private enterprises in the mainland have become the backbone of China's economic development. Forty years later, mainly shown in number one, private enterprises contributed more than fifty percent of tax revenue. Number two, private enterprises account for more than sixty percent of the gross domestic product GDP. Number three, seventy percent of the technological innovation achievements come from private enterprises. Number four. Private enterprises have employed more than eighty percent of urban populations. Number five, private enterprises account for over ninety percent of the total number of enterprises. After Xi Jinping took office in twenty twelve, the CCP's attitude and action towards private enterprises underwent a significant shift compared to the previous Jiang and Hu administrations. In the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution, the CCP invented the theory of the primary stage of socialism to deceive those in the West who still harbored illusions about it—a strategy of biding their time. The CCP allows the existence of a market economy, including private enterprises, as a supplementary and subordinate component under its controlled planned economy. Today, large private enterprises such as Alibaba, Tencent, and Jedi. dot com have grown so large that they dominate their respective industries. From the CCP's perspective, these companies pose a threat to their economic base. Relinquishing the planned economy to let the market economy develop would be equivalent to giving up to their economic dominance, a scenario the CCP refuses to entertain. Consequently, while erecting various barriers to restrict the entry and development of private enterprises, the CCP also seeks to nationalize these leading private enterprises. Additionally, they monitor companies' activities by directly deploying officials to work within them. In September 2019, the government of Hangzhou, a city home to numerous large enterprises, announced that it would appoint a hundred government officials as government affairs representatives to be stationed. In a hundred key private enterprises, including Alibaba, Hikvision, Geely, and Wahaha, under the pretext of building a bridge between the government and private enterprises. In reality, the CCP has long made arrangements for the development of private enterprises, especially those in key areas with strict access restrictions. Various. Factions are vying to plant their agents or confidants to take over or will direct control in the future. From 2017 onwards, a representative group of private enterprise tycoons began to retire in droves. Some fled, while others died under mysterious circumstances. Jack Ma stepped down as chairman of Alibaba. Liu Changdong resigned as CEO of JD. dot com. Wang Jiang, the chairman of HNA Group, died mysteriously in France in 2018. Zhao Yueting, the founder of Le Eco, fled to the United States in 2017. Wu Xiaohui, the chairman of Anbang Group, was sentenced by the CCP to 18 years in prison. Liu Xiyong, the owner of Hong Kong's Junyi Hotel, was forcibly extra- extradited to mainland by the CCP government and died after enduring torture. Mainland billionaire Xiao Jianhua, who held Canadian citizenship, was sentenced to 13 years by a Shanghai court. Moreover, the CCP would concoct various charges to imprison private entrepreneurs they deemed disobedient or potentially threatening. This was what happened to Shun Dawu, the founder of Hebei Dawu Agriculture and Animal Husbandry Group. Shun Dawu is a renowned private entrepreneur in Hebei and a billionaire. 
He and his wife co-founded Daewoo Agriculture and Animal Husbandry Group, which initially focused on agriculture and gradually expanded its operations into animal feed, real estate, education and healthcare. Sun Daewoo is recognized as an advocate for the rights of farmers in mainland China and rural land reform. He also founded Daewoo Hospital, which provided high quality medical service at low cost. He said, it is my shame if the hospital makes money. And it is my honor if the hospital loses money because I set up the hospital for you to cure diseases and save people. Why should it make money? It is understood that he had met the human rights lawyer from mainland China and financially supported their legal cost when they were prosecuted by the CCP. In late November 2020, Sun Daewoo and 20 relatives and business partners were detained by the local government on criminal charges under the pretext of land disputes at the farm he operates and unjustly sentenced by the CCP to 18 years. His Dawu group was forcibly auctioned off by the Gaobei Dian Court in Hebei for 686 million yuan to a new company that had been established for just three days. With the implementation of the Hong Kong version of the national security law, they treated Jimmy Lai, the owner of Apple Daily, in the same way. Hence, although the CCP recently announced numerous measures to promote private enterprises, these cannot alleviate the current economic difficulties and appear more like self-consolation. Bigger crises are looming, such as mainland real estate, local small and medium-sized banks, and local government debt, any of which could explode at any time. In fact, China's economic issues and political issues are intertwined. The current economic problems are fundamentally caused by political issues. If the structure of this regime does not fundamentally change, it would be impossible for China's economy to undergo a major transformation, both externally and internally. However, the CCP will never voluntarily relinquish power, which could lead to the full manifestation of conflicts in Chinese society, including internal struggles within the CCP. Conflicts between the central government and local government and conflicts between the public and the CCP regime. Therefore, the lack of economic solution is due to a lack of political solutions.